Richard? Ralph. Uh, Ralph, and we take one. Sorry, Ralph. So, Ralph, no big deal. This is all, we're just going to edit around this whole thing. So, you and I can just talk to the hard ones. So, um, 67 years old, and I thought you were like around my age, 52. And this whole time, because I, now I was like thinking, how could he have been around that long? That's why I asked you your age. Well, I spent the first 30 years of my life on the East Coast. Um, Albany, New York boy. Uh, got out of there young, 17. Uh, but I, I worked so much on the East Coast that by the time I was 30 years old, I was burned out. Uh, I had done, I had been with people like Rory Block. She had a chrys uh, chrysalis uh, contract. And there were some other people that I worked with back there. But I wasn't, it was mostly New Jersey gigs, bars, six nights a week, you know, five, six sets a night. And uh, we, we were tight, we were strong, you know, but uh, it wasn't leading to anything constructive. So I came out here in 80. And within a few years, I, I hooked up with the alley. And when I hooked up with the alley... Uh, can, we, can you just repeat the last phrase? You were scratching the microphone, but I couldn't hear. Thanks. I'm sorry. No, no worries. Don't worry about it all. Yeah, I came out here in 80, and uh, I hooked up with the alley uh, shortly after, a few years after. And by coming here, I found a, a sense of belonging to something, because L.A. can be cold. The weather's really warm out here, but L.A. can be very cold. And, and New York can be the opposite. It can be very cold back there, but very warm because people take you in, you know. But this is one of those places that reflected the old style, the old school. Uh, they gave people a chance to, if you were down on your luck, the musicians could come here and grab a little hole in the wall somewhere and play their instrument and keep doing their art. Uh, this place gave, and the people that ran it, Bill and Shiloh, gave it a chance for everybody. I'll give you a perfect example. I, w I worked for another company uh, for about four years, and the owner of the company, I'm not going to mention any names, wanted to know what was going on down here. He says, well, you know, what's going on down there? He says, what, do people live there? And he says, uh, what's going on like that? And I said to him, Shiloh and Bill are the kind of people that give people down on their luck a chance to stay here and compete. And, and the ones that are the hungriest, the ones that are there to get the job every time are the ones that they, they look at, the ones they give a chance to. I says, and a lot of people have come out of this place and scored big. I mean, just by the atmosphere here, by the ambiance in the place. Uh, you come in here and you get a, a different way. It's like a sanctuary. And... Uh, I've worked at so many big places in town, they, they offer me free time with my bands. Like if they'll say, if you're playing, you know, we'll give you free time. Just come in and you can use the studios. I pay for this place. I pay my money for each hour that I play here because they deserve it. And uh, they're mom and pop. You know, they've always, they were always mom and pop. And uh, it's like a candy store on the corner and Target moves in and knocks the candy store off. Well, this place didn't get knocked off. <laughs> This place held up under a lot of pressure, a lot of big guns, a lot of big studios in town, have rehearsal halls. But when the bands leave here for a little while, I notice they all come back. They want to find what they had when they were here. And if they're going away, they get a little too big, they're, they've moved up on the ladder. They wind up turning around and coming back and booking the place for a few months so that they get the feel again. And they'll go out and write another album in here, and they'll go out and produce that album, and it'll again, bang, it'll hit again, you know. And they they know why, you know. The people know why. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to remember this place no matter how long I live. 67. I hope I live to be 107. But if I do, I'll be. This place will be in my mind most of the time, you know. Let me ask you a quick question. This day place is days away from being sold and bulldozed and just knocked down to yeah. make a retail. Yeah. And it was just a luck of fate that some people got a hold of me and we worked out some deals with invest investors. And, and I need you to repeat what I say because I'm off mic, so this is not going to be heard except for you repeating it, okay? W to repeat what I say. What is it like to, in your own words, what is it like to know this place was so close to coming down? We're actually to the point where you guys are selling the stuff inside the place. And that heartache you had. I mean, it must have been heartache. I saw Bill. Bill and I were almost in tears when we hugged. I mean, you know, I'm talking about... Uh, I, I was... 
the selling of this stuff was like selling precious metal. Just, just repeat what I just say. This place was days away from being sold yeah. and brought down. And the, I, we were almost for So that's the only way we're going to hear the audio. Okay, the this audio. place was days from being taken down, all right, flattened. Uh, different ideas were coming up of what they were going to do with it. And it was hurting everybody involved. It was, it's a family here. Uh, and every, everybody involved was at each other's throats sometimes. Right. Uh, not understanding how to deal with this. It was a terrible divorce. It was the kind of war of the roses in your head, you know, kind of pain that you were going through. And it was all emotional. It was no physical pain. I mean, I mean, it, you felt it physically, but it was emotionally in your head. Every time you looked around or walked, walked out of the place and looked over your shoulder and looked back at it, all these memories started coming, you know, coming back real fast. And it was really hard to deal with. And selling of the gear, someone had something to say to me about the gear, about what it was worth. And what I said to him was, I will not, whatever the instrument was, it doesn't mean, it could be an oboe. It, it doesn't make any difference what the instrument was to me. Uh, if someone had played a 57 Stratocaster like Jimi Hendrix, and you try to sell the, the Stratocaster to somebody, that guitar would be worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because Jimi Hendrix had played it at like anywhere, okay, or at the whiskey or something. These instruments in here have been played by the best musicians known to man, okay? They've come in here and they've sat down at these instruments and their fingers have touched the keys and they've, their fingers have played the strings and played through the bass amps and guitar amps. Selling them was like selling secretariat or something. It was just really hard to deal with. And fortunately, you came through, John, in your own way, you came through with something that that salvaged and everybody's, you know, kind of in a position now where we're kind of relieved at where it's, the whole thing of this place is every time something is sold, we want it to go to someone who cares about what it is. Uh, there's just something about this stuff. And if somebody appreciates, I, I had to sell some stuff to a, a gentleman who owns a, a store and he came in here. And the one thing he said that was stuck with me is still with me. Uh, his name was Mark. And he came in, he said, back when he was a nobody, as he put it, he came here for his first job with, might have been the people in KISS. And he was just a little tech, okay? He, <laughs> he said, nobody knew me. And he came in here and he was walking around with the person that he was here with, the guitar player or whatever it was. And Bill, the owner, came down and was talking to the, the musicians, because he did that all the time. He intermingled with everybody. He knew who was here, what they were doing, what kind of music they did. He understood that. He, he understood musicians like nobody else. This place, everything that's in here is ideas he p picked from minds, the best minds of music. And he admitted it. I'll pick your mind. I'll take you know, what you've got and make it work for you. And he did. That's why they love this place so much. But he came down and he said to Mark, who are you? And he introduced himself. Mark said, he treated me like a king, like he, I was somebody. He says, and I never forgot that. Well, that guy came in here and bought some gear because he has a business now. He bought the gear and he was just about in tears and said to me, you don't understand what this, what this means to me. And I said, Mark, yes, I do understand. Okay, if anybody understands, I understand what you're feeling right now because we all felt that way about the people and the, the wood in this building. The wood is precious. See the wood? That's what makes the sound in here. You go into these places, they're all drapes, they're all this, they're all that, they're all the other thing. They're metal, they're, you know, flashy, lights all over the place. This has got soul like no place else. This has the soul. I went up north, I took the chili peppers up north. They were doing a recording after they had woodshedded in here for about six months. They went up to Big Bear and they did a, a recording up there. And they happened to do it in one of the Beach Boys recording studios. Uh, Al Jardin uh, is one of the Beach Boys. And the studio that he built 
is so reminiscent of this room. And I come back and I said to Bill, Bill, have the Beach Boys ever been in here? And that way he was. He'd turn his head, he'd look out the window for a second back. He'd say, yeah, they were back here. And he described when they were here. And I said to him, I go, well, one of the guys must have really appreciated what you got here. I said, because that studio up there is so reminiscent of your, your room, you know. He just got a big grin on his face because he, he knew what he had here. It was uh, the Golden Goose. It's amazing, the, all the memories you have of this place. How about the, in the last couple of years with Bill's health, you and I both know he was in, in, um, yeah. in, in, in a bad way, and you know, we both saw him you know, going. We both lost some people um, that are close to us. Um, and to see Bill go slowly and see Shiloh suffering and then having a stroke, I mean, how do you, how do you summarize the fact that the, the, the head of the, of the family is gone? This place is hard to describe in terms of being rational or being down to earth, okay? It's, it runs on spiritual power, I think, okay? Bill ran hard. If you look in the dictionary and it says rebel, they got a picture of Bill next to it, okay? He ran hard. He ran fast. He split lanes when he was on that motorcycle. I was with him at Bonnie Raitt concerts going down the 5 at uh, or 405 or whatever, we, whatever road we were on. And we were going 50, 60 miles an hour between bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic and a split lane, okay? Uh, if you ran with Bill, you had to run hard. And he ran, he burned his candle at both ends, and that's what made this place so successful, okay? He, it, he was into this place. It was in his blood. It was in, he was up 4 o'clock in the morning in the shop fixing something that needed to be fixed. You know, this place was in his bones, man. This, this was Bill. That's why I call it Fort Elkins, okay? There's a little arrow sticking in it all over the place. You know, you can call it Fort Apache or whatever you want to call it. It's Fort Elkins that, because this is where the guy's mindset was. It was him against the world for a long time until he met Shiloh. And when, when he met Shiloh, it was like he had an army behind him. Nothing could stop him then, okay? And she was the most dedicated woman I've ever met in my life. And Deanna loved her. Uh, we all loved her. We, we just, you know, and, and watching her, watching her fade there for a while, I, there was times when, like I said, I, I thought she was in a vortex and I was pulling her feet back, <laughs> back in here, not letting her go. She was the whole spirit of this place. And when, when she finally came to the point where she had to go up north with her father, like this place seemed to get silent. Just like it is now. But there was always the sound of Shiloh. Somebody calling her name. Uh, you know, bells ringing. Her answering the bells. Uh, her being at the board. Coming in saying hello to people like Danny Seraphim. Those people. Uh, they all adored her. You know. And uh, when Bill finally passed, it was really hard on her. But she is one tough German woman who would not, I mean, she would, she would stand against the elements more than anybody I've ever seen in my life, okay? She's the strongest. I mean, my mother, I'm sure your mother was a strong woman too. Women are strong. This girl was uh, in another league when it comes to strength. You know, she, uh, she just did it all. But uh, Let me just interrupt you real quick. Shiloh got really sick in 2000. She had stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. They removed a stage four cancer tumor from her, size of a watermelon, yeah. a small watermelon. They told her she was going to die. Mm -hmm. She went off to see a doctor named Dr. Diaz, mm -hmm. which Bill found. Mm -hmm. And she went off for a month to be cured of cancer altogether by this medicine man. Mm -hmm. And now that Shiloh has had a stroke, Dr. Diaz has come in from another country to treat Shiloh again and try and get her back where she's able to have a quality life. He, he will. He will. You know why? Because she believes in him. He has done his magic before. And I just seen her come back from something that I, I, that I haven't seen too many people come back from already. Like just the progress she made from the day she left here. And I saw her off in the ambulance to when she left with her father to go up north. There was a I didn't think she was going to make it, 
okay? And I'm a real positive person. I didn't think she was going to make it, but when the, when I held my breath for five days. I wasn't talking to anybody. I wasn't saying anything to anybody because it was only one thing on my mind. I was trying to keep my job, keep going at my job, and just, I'm not a, I'm a Catholic boy. I was an altar boy when I was a kid. Haven't said many prayers, but I said a few prayers. And man, when her father called me and told me that she'd come out of it and she was going to be okay, the doctor said she was going to be okay, uh, it was the best thing. It was the absolute best thing. It was the, nothing has been that good to, in years. <laughs> right, Brad? Uh, yeah. Brad knows. He's been here a long time, too, you know. We all worried through, for her through that, you know. She, uh, this is an emotional time for you. <laughs> be. I don't get emotional too much. No, I'm I a, know that. I, uh, yeah, but, uh, but you know, everything what? turned out well. That's, that, exactly. that's the point for me. I mean, I'm, I think of the positive. Hold your thoughts one second. Good. I'm going to ask you. We just had to do that for two seconds. Yeah. Since we're at the point where we're talking about loved ones and, you know, poetry believe it or not, it was very close to you. I was close to poetry. And she talked about you very often. You know why? We'd had some moments together uh, where we were alone, okay? And usually people are, there's always people around, okay? And we were actually able to find out who each other was. Not, not in any sexual way or anything like that. It was strictly in the head. And you know yourself because you know her so well. That when she got in those moments of those, she was being truthful and she was being who she was. Uh, she was one of the most wonderful people in the world, okay? And when she got wild, I just, like that incident when you said, yeah. when I walked in and she was flailing away with her blouse off yeah. with the sticks in the air, I saw such a positive soul in there that I had to say to her, that's the most wonderful thing you could do. It's, it, it, she, she, wasn't, she wasn't like... Uh, the drummer Samantha, who played with Motley Crue or anything like that, she had never had the chance to learn younger. I tried to show her how to count and to do stuff like that. But she was so into it that you, she didn't need any of that. The entertainment value of what she was doing was worth a million dollars just to watch her enjoy herself. Th that's what people don't do enough on stage. People don't enjoy themselves. They're thinking too much. They're trying to impress people too much. They're, they're, they're not having a good time. They're worried about what they're doing. Okay, being behind the drums is like being in an office behind a desk. You have this protection that you're never, you're never going to forget it. It's like whenever I sit down behind a kit and put a pair of sticks in my hand, I'm free. Okay, I can fly. It's like being in a 747 for me. And that's the way it was for her. That's what I enjoyed so much about her is her freedom to express herself. And with the drums, no less. I'm a drummer. You know, I got an affinity for that. You know, and it, I see a woman... For having a good time, that's all. It, that's what it's all about, right there. And she was, she was a great girl, man. She was. We lost too many people these last couple of years. Uh, I'm watching people around me just disappear, and I don't know. You know, it's a hard life. You know, we, it's, we do it until we can't do it anymore. Rock and roll. And that's what you know. This place has done what it's done until it couldn't do it anymore. And ha having it turn into a place where, a place of higher learning for this, for the arts. Arts have taken a pounding over the last 20 years. They've taken the stuff out of schools. Uh, I go by Fulton out there and I hear the band playing in the thing and I want to go up there and help these kids. I want to give them drums. I want to show them how to really do it. Because my training came from one of the greatest teachers in the world, Art Nelson. He was a drummer who was in the Skyliners of New York, Drum and Bugle Corps. He was in the Hawthorne Caballeros. These are Drum and Bugle Corps from the 50s and 60s. And that's where I learned to use these. And a lot of people don't have that advantage. Uh, they go and they sit and they learn to play like this. This guy was Svengali, okay? He made my hands blister and bleed until I did it right. And uh, I'll never forget him. And again, he would appreciate this place because it's a place of higher learning for music you know that's I feel this place every day and I'm gonna to have to move I've been living here for 12 years I'm gonna to have to move and it's 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 not a question of going someplace else it's having to leave here it's like I I, I adjusted early that you know nothing lasts forever I want this place to last forever I want it I want this to go on for a long time you know 
We all do. Yeah. So let me ask you a question about, tell me about the nostalgia on the bricks. Like, who started the writing on the bricks? I would have, I, I it was probably, it started in the 70s, I would imagine. It started somewhere in the 70s. Uh, I see names on that wall. I, I wrote my name on there probably somewhere around uh, 88, maybe. Uh, the people on the wall in there, a lot of them, are great musicians who you don't know their name, but they played in one of the greatest bands, you know, and you, who's this guy? Oh, he played bass, like Larry Sims from Log Loggins and Messina. Now, I worked with him with Spencer, and I've worked with him, and just recently he passed away. <clears throat> those kind of guys, names are on, those, on that wall in there. And when you see a Jimi Hendrix uh, uh, handwriting and it's up six foot four in the air, you know, somebody tall wrote that, you know, it had right. to be him, you know. Uh, I think Elton John's name is on that wall in there, if I'm not mistaken. Well, instead of Tom Petty, it's what, Thomas Petty? See, I would think so. You know, who knows if somebody was playing a game or not, you know, because right. you're free to do whatever you want on that wall. And I noticed that all the other studios in town now are like uh, Swing House and Third Encore. They all have a wall going down their hallways with signatures on the wall, but it's not the bricks. It's never going to be the alley. Yeah. It's this, this, is, it's, this is the place. Anyway, this is one of the greatest places. That's all I've got to say about it. Ralph, thanks, man. Awesome. You're welcome. Second right now, I'm 67. No shit. Yeah. No shit. No, no, not at all. No shite. Oh, really? Yeah, John. Yeah. 67? Yeah, I'm 67, and the time is shot by. I, I sit. I shit you not. I had no idea. I thought you might. When, when I came, when I came, I got here, a lot was, more respect for you now. <laughs> when I came here, I was 55. I'd already passed my prime uh, when I got here, but time flew. The last 12 years that I've been here has flown by so amazingly fast, and it's the old saying: if you're having a good time, you know, time flies. If you're you're having a good time, and uh, it, it went by so fast, I never I never felt as comfortable anywhere, and I've traveled from coast to coast, back and forth a few right. times. Well, you're New York boy. Yeah, and I've never felt as comfortable living some, and I've lived in studios most of my life. I mean, from the time I was 17, I was on the road and I was always a studio or hooked up with some kind of studio where I was in a back room or upstairs or downstairs or in a girl's room or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was always so comfortable here be uh, because of the kind of job I do. I do cartage for uh, uh, a well-known uh, cartage company in town. And uh, why don't you explain to people what does cartage mean? Because people don't know what that means. Musicians need their gear picked up and brought somewhere when they, especially when they reach a certain level. Uh, most of the guys, most of my era of guys, we put it in a trailer and dragged it behind us in the car, six of us in the car, and all the gear in a four by eight. But uh, coming to L.A. and if you've kind of made your mark, you have a hit, anything like that, you're going to need somebody to store your gear, pick it up bring it to the venue, and go and get it, and bring it back, and that's what we do. Now, are you setting up the gear, too? Can we start over? Yeah, we're going to start at the beginning again. Well, yeah, thanks. We're going to do fresh audio. No, this is good stuff. Yeah, it, but it's great. <clears throat> now, yeah, Ralph, so, you're going to... So now this is officially recording? Yeah, we're just, we just were rolling through it, but now we're going to do sound. Yeah. This is why I do the 3 2 you your first, first, last name, and um, your birthday. Coffee, Sorry about that. You don't um, want my social security oh, number. No, uh, <laughs> it's just uh, hey, it's taxes, huh? No, uh, we're not going to use it. It's never. Yeah, it's like it. a screen it's test just, kind of thing, right? Like, right. Yeah. First, last name, birthday, <laughs> and I give you guys a release for the documentary for the alley. We're going to be using. We're obviously we're trying to you know get donations for the alley. That's the purpose. My never. name is Ralph James. Uh, my birth date is nine ten forty nine, and this has been the alley. Sweet. Thank you very much. You're I got a lot of respect. Awesome job. Thank sorry you about uh, yeah, the Yeah, thank you very good. much. Very that, well spoken too. Really meant a lot. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Well, for this place, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna pull any punches with the truth. It's just, oh yeah, just, not just, about that. Ralph, you should have your own show. Right? <laughs> that was fucking great. Podcast. I'm sorry, Johnny Carson. I, I agree. That's a strong interview. That was very that's strong. Strongest interview I've seen. Freaking.